So the answer is 59. I'll let you figure out the question. <laughs> the story is told when Harry Goldstein asked his father, Abba, if you don't believe in God, why do you go to synagogues so regularly? His father answered, Jews go to synagogue for all kinds of reasons. My friend Garfinkel goes to talk to God. I go to talk to Garfinkel. <laughs> Our members come to this temple for all kinds of reasons. For some, this is a place to participate in life cycle events, such as baby namings, barabat mitzvahs, weddings, funerals, and so on. Others come to services on a regular basis. Some come to enjoy a schmooze and the onig. Some come to bring their children to religious schools. Others become more involved in the various arms of temple, such as the sisterhood, the men's club, morning minion, 60 plus, East Side Jews, youth activities, and so on. And each group has a unique purpose and role within the temple, but all provide a strong sense of belonging. Synagogues have played an important role in preserving the Jewish religion and culture throughout history. I like to think of our shul as a place where we come and we are infused with the oxygen of Judaism. In Hebrew, there are three phrases that each translate as the word synagogue. Each refers to a different aspect of synagogue life. Beit tefillah means a house of prayer. Beit Knesset means a house of meeting. And Beit Midrash means a house of study or learning. Prayer, meeting, and learning. Temple Shalom is all of this and more. Let me explain. My wife, Anne, grew up in Leeds in northern England. Her family was part of a close synagogue community. Her parents were active in their shul, and their social life revolved around it. Their friends were the religious school teachers and board members. Synagogue life was an integral part of Anne's upbringing. I grew up in a very different part of the world, in a community on the island of Cyprus, small and intimate, but one that through war became scattered throughout the world. So when we immigrated here 37 years ago, we didn't know anybody, and Anne's natural inclination was to join a synagogue. And we joined this shul by accident. We were supposed to join Beth Israel, which had been recommended by the synagogue in Leeds, which was aligned to the conservative movement here. It just happened that Temple Shalom was in the next block to where Anne was living on West 10th, which seemed a happy coincidence. So we showed up at a Friday night service in late August 1980. Rabbi Bregman had just arrived. I think there were probably just over 100 families at the time. So two soon-to-be-married 22-year-olds walked in and were warmly greeted at the door of the sanctuary by Louis Zagan. We were hooked. Louis was an old-timer, close to 90 at the time, made dirty jokes, carried a pocket full of candy for the kids, and was the self-appointed greeter. Louis fittingly lived in the Louis Briar. He wore these very wide ties that were fashionable in the 70s, and for him, they did double duty as both tie and napkin. <laughs> you could always tell what Louis had just had for supper. Louis made sure we attended the Oneg afterwards, which, as starving young adult students, was much appreciated. We visited the office a few days later, just before Rosh Hashanah, and after recovering from sticker shock, signed up as members. Our annual commitment started at $360 a year. This was 1980. I had just started work and was earning $14,000 a year, and Anne was still a student at UBC. It was close to a month's rent, but we wanted to belong. Within a very short time, we were embraced by several members. The Kersons, Sid was the president then, the Groves, the Gutmans, the Bregmans, and many others. Invitations to Shabbat dinners followed, and very soon we found a new family and friends. And in this great city, our social lives revolved to a great extent around Temple Shalom. It wasn't long before we were conscripted to run the youth group, not one of our most successful undertakings, especially given the trail of destruction that we left in our wake in Whistler one weekend. That's a long story. 
I then got involved in the temple finances, and Anne became a Sunday school teacher at the religious school, opting to change her career from rocks to kids. When tragedy struck in 1984, our first child was stillborn. We attended a support group at Children's Hospital, but quickly realized we didn't need it. We had our own support here at the shul. My experiences serving on the board, executive, and various committees as president over 20 years ago was invaluable to my own personal and professional growth. I learned the gamut from human resources, budgeting, financing, fundraising, figuring out where to relocate after the building on West 10th was firebombed, to being part of the group who was brave enough or crazy enough to start building this building as our own contractors because we didn't have enough money to hire one in the hope that the community would actually take us seriously and believe we were going to build this building, and of course, mastering the art of only paying wholesale if we had to pay at all. Anne became the school principal in 1990 and had what she describes as the best job in the world. So in addition to being able to grow spiritually, we both learned life lessons that have helped us both in our careers and in life generally and the skills I developed through actively participating in temple committees contributed to the success, I believe, of my career at PWC and beyond in no small measure. I share our story with you today in the hope that you will grasp the warmth and welcome of the Temple Shalom community. We have found active synagogue membership to be life-enhancing in a profound way. Our experience is that supporting our shul both physically, emotionally, and financially are the best investments we have ever made. It is the relationships behind the official programs that are the reward of being a member of the synagogue. It might mean going out of your comfort zone, as we did when we first invited Rabbi Bregman and Kathy for dinner shortly after we joined. We managed to give the rabbi food poisoning, but we seem to have been forgiven. Our synagogue is a place where our members come together to pray, to learn, not just Jewish learning, but life skills, professional skills, to develop community, to meet new people, to celebrate life, its ups, its downs, in a caring environment. It is a Beit Tefillah, a Beit Knesset, and a Beit Midrash. If you are a new member, and we have a wonderfully large group of new members who have joined us this year, we are very proud that so many of you have indeed joined us. Please engage with this special community. Get to know some of the fascinating people that call Temple Shalom home, and you will find not only social connections, but the opportunity to develop all sorts of skills beyond the ones you thought you might, you might gain by joining this shul. And if you are a more established member and you're not already doing so, please reach out and embrace the next generation, just as the previous generation embraced us. Invite them to Shabbat dinner with you and adopt those new in town. You cannot underestimate the power of an invitation. And as Florence Baton, Joyce Cherry's mother, who is soon to be 102, tells us, one of the secrets of longevity is to hang out with people younger than yourselves. Were it not for the warm invitations many years ago, this president might not be standing here today. I invite you to step forward and join the various groups in the shul, and let us know if you're interested in participating in the lay leadership of the temple. It is true for many things, and we have found it to be true for synagogue membership, that the more you give, the more you will receive. And my wish for you this new year is to find the same level of reward that we have, Active social membership helps ensure the continuation of Judaism for your families and the next generation. Gamar Khatima Tovah.